and welcome to another installment of Beards and Cars, and this time we are revisiting a type of video which I've done before, in the case of my five best and worst things about owning a Touareg V10, and I will be bringing this back again in the near future to do my best and worst things about owning a Maserati Quattroporte, which of course I owned before this car technically. Now this time we're talking about owning a Jag XKR, as I currently do. Mine is a 57 plate, so in the UK that's the later half of 2007, and it's the aluminium bodied X150 shape, with of course the supercharged 4.2 litre engine. Rear wheel drive, 420 horsepower, all that kind of good juicy stuff. It's black with a black and tan interior with the 20 inch centre wheels, and when I purchased the car it already had Fuse 19 removed, which is a nifty little trick where you can have your exhaust valves open all the time to really hear that lovely V8 engine. But the purpose of this video, much like with my Touareg video, is to talk about my personal experience, so very much so different to the way I would typically talk about cars, and that's the whole point of these videos, in terms of the things that in my experience I've really liked, and not liked as much about actually owning one. If you want to hear a general review about this car or the 5 litre version etc, I have reviewed them in Beards and Cars as well, you can find those here on the channel, and I've even done of course showdown videos, rivals matches as I call them, between XKRs and other vehicles such as Maseratis and even the 4.2 versus the 5 litre. But without any further ado, let's get straight into the positives and the negatives. Let's start off with a good point. My first thing that I like about the car is unsurprisingly, it sounds really nice. And even though of course that goes without saying, it does. You want a car that sounds as good as it looks, and in a similar way to my Maserati, it very much does. It puts a smile on people's face, it sounds beefy, it's kind of quintessentially British, but in a very modern sense, it sounds great, put simply. Now, since that's a relatively simple point, let's move into my first negative. Now this one is easily my biggest negative so far, and it is something which is more related to a potential owner, so if you are one of those, listen up. That is that even though I haven't had any major issues with the car yet, I've had a number of smaller gremlins, which are that kind where they pop up, you've just fixed one thing and now something else crops up, and even though none of them are particularly expensive to fix, they're just kind of annoying. Small electrical issues or maybe something that doesn't quite work as it should here or there. And as I said, it's nothing crazy. Maybe a squeaky belt on the supercharger or needing a section of new brake line over here. But again, it's not a crazy issue. It's certainly been a better experience already than my Maserati was in this same time frame. But nonetheless, I'm not a fan of cars that have these constant smaller issues. And of course, no two owners and no two XKRs are going to be exactly the same. I'm sure there are owners who've had them for years with no issues at all, and there are probably other people who absolutely hate them, much like I did with my Maserati. Spoiler alert. But that is my experience with the XKR so far. To move back into the positives, the second thing is exactly what you'd want to know you are going to get from an ownership experience, and that is the presence, the looks, and the compliments. The car has incredible presence on the road, it has the kind of status symbol appearance of an Aston Martin, but at a fraction of the price. It's like half the price of the cheapest V8 Vantage you can buy, and in my opinion, having driven a V8 Vantage, this is the better car, certainly in terms of bang for buck. And it has this effect which I absolutely love, in that it's not a car which makes people either hate you or envy you. If you pull up in a Ferrari, people think you're an idiot. If you pull up in a Lamborghini, people envy you. If you pull up in an Aston, it puts a smile on people's face. It just has a different kind of quality, and the Jag XKR has that. It's like a Maserati, it's like an Aston. Those kind of vehicles which develop kids into petrol heads, they make older people smile, they make middle-aged people think, oh, maybe I should get one of those. It's just a universally likable car. And I do get a ton of compliments and double takes from people when I drive past in the car. Now the next negative thing to move back to that side actually somewhat ironically talks about the subject of sounds again. And this is something which I've mentioned on the channel and if you're thirsty for more XKR content be sure to stick around on the channel in the coming weeks because on this exact subject I am planning to get my exhaust changed on this car. In fact, I'm doing a center-back straight pipe stainless replacement to delete the back box, 
with some gorgeous looking quad pipes which is going to make the car a whole lot louder. Now that is where my issue comes in. So I already mentioned that I like the sound, but that's from the outside. Everyone behind you can get the benefit of the car. Every passenger, every you know person who you drive past on the street, they can hear it, but you as the driver can't because of the shape of the car. So much of the sound is way back there somewhere that because the cabin is so long, the car is so long, and the soundproofing is ironically too good for my liking, it's too sedate. And for an older driver, that's probably great, but for me, a young buck, I want to hear that supercharged motor. So that's a kind of pet peeve of mine. And of course, that's the main reason why I'm getting that stainless system fitted. And as I said, video to follow. Now, the next positive thing is the way it delivers its performance. And this is something which, of course, I talk about a lot in my car reviews, and that is the subject of twisting power, or literally torque. Brake horsepower is great, high revving screaming engines are fantastic, but I will almost every time choose a lazy, torquey motor, because for one thing, they tend to be more reliable because they never have to work that hard, they tend to be good for fuel economy for what they are, my Touareg was really good for a crazy size engine, this is good for a super sports car, returning about 23 to the gallon average, and that is all due to the torque, or at least a lot of it is due to the torque. Because it has so much, and this compares very well to the video I'm going to do about my Maserati, which did not have a lot of torque, this car just never feels like it's working that hard. It's got big, lazy British muscle, and being lazy is not a bad thing when it comes to its engine. It makes it so much more useful on a daily basis, and I love the way this car delivers its performance. Now, my next pet peeve is something which especially certain older drivers will probably roll their eyes at, saying, well, if you can afford an XKR, why do you even care? But to me, it's not about the money, it's about the principle of the thing, and that is, why is the road tax so damn high on this car? It's £580 a year, which, unless I'm mistaken, is the highest bracket there is, I was paying that much for my Touareg V10 twin turbo diesel of a beast with 600 pound feet of torque. The, there's no way you can tell me that this puts out the same emissions that that did. And in what world does it make sense where this is 580 pounds a year when my Ferrari engined Maserati cost me 340 pounds a year? It just doesn't make sense. It's based on more than just emissions, it's the year, the car, and all that nonsense. But it's just that annoying little thing to me. Speaking of money though, one thing which I love about it, to move to the positive side again, is the sheer value for money. Or as I often like to say in my reviews, the bang for buck. Now this being about half the price of an Aston Martin V8 Vantage with at least as good performance means that of course the value for money is great. But, and this is one of the key points of why I bought one, and you can kind of roll this into one of the advantages as well if you want to consider it such, it's not anywhere near as expensive to maintain, repair, or otherwise buy parts for as most other exotics of its caliber. What was a 60, 70,000 pound car when new does not cost anywhere near the kind of prices of something like the equivalent Porsche 911, certainly not a Maserati, etc. in terms of repairing, maintaining, replacing, and servicing. And it's not just me who thinks that, a lot of Jag owners can vouch for that fact. And that, of course, is all under the general idea of value for money. It's nice to be able to afford to buy a car, but there's a huge difference between being able to buy something and being able to afford something. That was the miscalculation that I made when I purchased my Maserati. Yes, I could afford to buy the car, but maintenance was a whole different thing, and I learned that the hard way. My final not-so-good point, before we get back into the positives, is actually one which is kind of an expected thing for many people when it comes to British vehicles, but for me it's a little bit disappointing, especially in comparison to, bear with me, my Touareg. A strange comparison to make, I know, but bear with me and you'll understand what I mean. This annoyance for me is the fit and finish. And what I mean by that is certain components, especially in the cabin, the liner of the trunk as well, or the boot as we call it here in the UK, these things where parts come together, where leather meets plastic, meets wood, meets metal, some of the fit and finish, especially when it comes to stuff like rubber seals around the inside of the windows, if you actually look at it, it's not necessarily as tidy as up to scratch as you might hope for 
on a 70 grand car. Now it looks great, it has a gorgeous interior, but it's these smaller things like the corner of the rear passenger window where it curves around on the side of the car, or the liner in the boot which doesn't quite seem to fit properly. It's just those smaller things which are a little bit under par to me. And again, the reason why I compare it to my Touareg is because when that was a new car, it was somewhere in the region of £54,000. So not that massive of a price difference to what this Jag would have been. And yet, that Touareg was built like a tank. It only ever broke down once in the entire time I had it. It wasn't even engine related, it was the suspension. And in terms of the way it was put together, I cannot fault it, it was flawless. This. Not so much. It's a little bit more British in that way. And even though mechanically it's good, it's some of the cosmetic stuff, again, almost entirely on the interior, that isn't quite as good. It's about 90% there, but not quite as good as I'd hoped for for a £70,000 car. The final positive point that I want to touch on is, I believe, a massively important one, and yet it's one which you probably will not hear in many other videos or from many other journalists. And that's why you should stick around here on my channel. <laughs> because that is the community. It's all well and good buying a great car, but if you find that you've bought into a community of absolute idiots, and I'm sure you can think of certain cars from various countries that have that kind of reputation, well, that could be an issue that you now have to live with, being lumped in with that group, or potentially, and this is the more important point, not necessarily having a hugely helpful resource if your car does go wrong, or just needs a certain part which is rare, or a specific advice piece on maintenance, or, you know, keeping the car going. The Jaguar clubs that I'm in, which are nothing special, they're just owners groups on, for instance, Facebook, they're very helpful. Most of them are older male drivers, as you'd expect, but they've owned multiple cars, they have experience, they tend to be more measured in their advice. And really, being in a high quality owner's club or group of enthusiasts who love their car, much like you get the impression a lot of Porsche owners do, well, that has so many advantages. And I'm not just talking about meetups and friends and stuff like that. I mean, if your car breaks down and somebody knows what's wrong with it, or if you're looking for a rare part, be it mechanical or visual, somebody will probably know where you can get it from. These are very, very useful resources and the XKR has a really good community behind it. So I think that is a very strong point in its favor. And as I said, be sure to check out my video like this for my Touareg V10 if that interests you, and stick around, of course, for that video when I put the new exhaust on my XKR as well. And in general, to wrap up this series so far with the three cars that I've owned in the form of my former Maserati Quattroporte. But until next time, I'll see you then. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.